going to come back to today. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Mary McAuliffe, who, uh, if I spent a, went through her whole CV, I think we'd be here too long. But she's a teaching and a research fellow in women's studies in UCD in the School of Social Justice. But even more importantly, Mary has just finished an enormously productive three-year term as the president of the Women's History Association of Ireland. And they culminated her term uh, with a hugely successful conference in the Collins uh, Barracks down the road uh, on Common Amon. So she, those of you who haven't already seen on the Century Ireland website, you'll see Mary's terrific introductions to the main founding members of Come and Amon and realise what a good speaker she is. So before uh, you get tired of listening to me, I'm going to introduce you to Mary and uh, afterwards we'll open the floor to questions. Thanks. It's a great pleasure to be asked, and a great honour to be asked, to give this talk here in Smithfield and Stony Batter, because Mary didn't mention, but I'm also part of uh, the group that worked on these, although I, I have been a bit absent in the last while, because of organising the Coming Amon 100. And uh, we had a uh, centenary celebration in Glasnevin with the President, uh, laying a wreath, and for the first time, a honour guard uh, completely composed of uh, female members of the um, Irish uh, Defence Forces, Army, Navy and Air Force. Uh, it was a very special day. We laid a wreath at the grave of Elizabeth O'Farrell, uh, a native Dubliner, member of Indian Nehera and member of Common Amman, the woman who gave the surrender uh, with Pauri Pierce in 1916. Uh, and then we had a two-day conference. Oh, well, I forgot. We also unveiled a plaque in Wynn's Hotel where the first meeting was. Um, it was uh, alarming to discover that uh, the volunteers had had their plaque for the last 30 years in Wynn's Hotel where they'd had some of their early meetings and it was only two weeks ago that the plaque to Common Amman was unveiled. Um, so this has been a year of re-looking at Common Amman uh, and that foundation period and what they did and who they were because of course people talk about Common Amman all the time but who actually were they? Um, they were a female nationalist organization and they hold their first meeting in Wynn's Hotel on the 2nd of April 1914. Uh, it was called at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and some of the critique of that and some of the critiques of, of Common Amman itself will come out because of course 4 o'clock in the afternoon meant that only those women who were not working could attend. So it was very much a middle class activist female organization in the beginning but I, I want to come back to that later on in the talk. It goes on to become one of the most influential women's organisations in 20th century Ireland and has its origins in two powerful ideologies which were driving uh, the socio-political transformation in Ireland in, in the first decades of the 20th century, nationalism and feminism. And again, feminism is an aspect of coming among that I think we really need to interrogate as well. A growing number of politically conscious Irish women were involved in almost all cultural, political, nationalist, activist organisations uh, where they were allowed, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, or set up their own organisations in the early decades of the 20th century. And these include such organisations as Indian the Heron, uh, Maud Gons Indian the Heron, suffrage groups like the Irish Women's Franchise League and other suffrage organisations, the Gaelic League, Sinn Féin, uh, they were supporters of the Irish Parliamentary Party, certainly up to 1912 and, and the Third Home Rule Bill, uh, and of course involved in various uh, activities in Dublin particularly, um, for workers' rights and setting up their own organisation in the Irish Women Workers' Union. So this latter, these first decades of the, the uh, 20th century had seen a growth in support of Irish nationalism, especially militant nationalism. North of the border you'd had the 40,000 men and 20, 250,000 men, women and 400,000 men who had opposed the introduction of Home Rule and set up the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant. The Ulster Volunteers had been founded. In response to that, in November 1913, the Irish Volunteers were founded. Sorry, I'm finding it very difficult to read my script. There you are. The Irish Volunteers were founded at a meeting in the Rotunda. It was, this was to allow Irish men a forum through which to express their support for Irish freedom. 
And there were women here at this meeting in the Rotunda, and they heard Lawrence Kettle say that the in the volunteer manifesto, which said there would be work for women to do. Now, women weren't very much part of this, but there would be work for them to do. But what would this work be? And nationalist women wanted to know what this work would be, and they joined the debate about whether they should campaign to join the Irish volunteers. But it was clear if they were allowed to join, they wouldn't do so on an equal basis. The IRB perhaps was more um, um, open to allowing women to become involved, and Kathleen Clark, uh, wife of Tom Clark, who was the head of the uh, IRB member, rebel and signatory to the proclamation, <coughs> said it was her husband who first suggested a women's organization, a women's nationalist organization. However, these debates went on and finally the women came together to organize themselves as coming and Mon on the 2nd of April at the meeting held, uh, held at Wynn's Hotel. These women who met at Wynn's Hotel weren't women who were just coming to activism. They had been active for many, many years. And I'd like to name a few of these women because I think it's very important in women's history to name the women. Um, because we can say there were common among women, but who were they? Women like Jenny Wise Power, uh, a nationalist and suffragist who had been a fervor campaigner since her days as a teenager in the Ladies' Land League in 1880 with Anna Parnell. She was a co-founder of the cultural nationalist group In the Heron with Maud Gon, and involved with Sinn Féin from the very beginning, as well as being a member of several suffrage organizations. So you can see these women were serious women who had been involved in an awful lot of things. In Lauren Amon, published in 1919, Wise Power Remembers Come and Amon came uh, out of many information meetings which took place prior to April, uh, in, uh, in the months after the formations of the volunteers, to discuss the formation of a women's society which would aim to work independently. Finally, the meeting was called. It is work, as I said, noting the names and backgrounds of these, uh, of these women. Among them was Louise Gavin Duffy, a noted Gaelic scholar and nationalist, a woman who was also very sympathetic to the suffrage cause. And you can see, here we have feminists and nationalists coming together. She supported the campaign to have female suffrage included in the 1912 Home Room Bill. She was one of the first women to graduate from UCD and managed and thought at Scolida with Patrick Pierce. Agnes O'Farrelly, uh, a noted Gaelic scholar and lecturer in modern Irish, one of the most prominent women in the Gaelic League um, at the time, presided over the inaugural meeting and over 100 women attended. So that was a big meeting. Uh, for And you can see from that the interest in uh, women having a space in which to express their nationalism in 1914. O'Farrelly had already been one of the more prominent members, uh, women members of the Gaelic League and closely associated with leading figures in cultural nationalism in Ireland. She was a close friend of Roger Casement, among others, and she had gathered a would go on to gather a petition when he was tried uh, in 1916 uh, to reprieve his death sentence, which obviously was unsuccessful. She was also a strong supporter of Redmond and the Irish Parliamentary Party, a fact that was to cause problems pretty soon after uh, her, uh, the formation of Common Amon for her. In 1922, she was among a group of women who unsuccessfully sought to persuade the Irish, um, the anti-treaty IRA to avoid civil war. And later on with Professor Mary Hayden, she led the National University Women Graduates Association in their demand for the deletion of the articles in the draft constitution of 1937 uh, about women. So you can see that this is a woman who continued to be active after 1914. So these are women who, who know what they want and who are determined to find a place. They were politically savvy women, used to campaigning in various organizations, and they wished to find a space in which they and other Irish women could uh, express their nationalist belief. There were radicals among them, but the radicals um, moderated their viewpoints, and certainly in choosing Agnes O'Farrelly to deliver the inaugural speech, they had a respectable, non-threatening figure of the centre ground who would quell the anxieties among the broader nationalist community about what Common Man was and would do. Uh, but there is no doubt that even from the very beginning, uh, the more advanced nationalist women were the prime motivators for the setting up of Common Man. Initially, however, they do set themselves a more moderate course, and at that first meeting they adopted a constitution. I don't know if you see that, that's the plaque that was set up in Winds, uh, and the shine <coughs> makes it hard to see, but it includes their aims, which was to advance the cause of Irish liberty, 
to organize Irish women in the furtherance of that objective, to assist in arming and equipping a body of Irish men for the defence of Ireland, and this is going to be a stickler, this particular aim, uh, to form a fund for these purposes called the Defence of Ireland Fund, and other activities that were to engage in training, first aid, drill, signalling and rifle practice. O'Farrelly delivered the inaugural speech to the new organisations. She stated that the meeting was called so that Irish women could work in conjunction with the recently formed Irish volunteers in any action they would decide to break the connection with England. She emphasised the auxiliary nature of coming among, and in, a, in the aims were the seeds of the first serious debate among women from the broad nationalist and feminist church of current, at the time, Irish politics about the nature of female activism, particularly female nationalist activism. Many coming among members resented these accusations, as you can see from the, the PowerPoint, from suffrage, uh, suffragists, that they were auxiliaries or handmaidens to the volunteers, uh, or slave women, as they were called, uh, subservient to the role of the volunteers. In the suffrage newspaper of the 2nd of May, 1914, uh, there was much scorn poured on the coming among women. And you can see that the, uh, they're being very uh, sarcastic here, that the coming among women offer homage to the men. Their first duty is to give allegiance and support to the men. Uh, and these are all kinds of uh, phrases that are scattered throughout and give its, its keynote, the inaugural speech. And they see this as a thoroughly reactionary step, a retrograde step for women in Ireland, for the equality of women. However, Cumann Amman was not going to take this uh, accusation lightly, and they put up a stout defence of their position, uh, particularly from Mary Collum here, uh, the wife of Pori Collum. She said, from the start, we of Cumann Amman decided to do any national work that came within the scope of our aims. We would collect money or arms. We would learn ambulance work. We would learn how to make haversacks and bandoliers. We would study the question of food supplies. We would practice the use of rifles. We would make speeches. We would do everything that came in our way. Nothing is too high or too low for us to attempt. For we are not the auxiliaries or the handmaidens or the camp followers of the volunteers. We were their allies. If some unhappy faith were now to destroy the volunteers, coming on is not only capable of still growing and flourishing, it is capable of bringing the whole volunteer movement to life again. So you can see a very stout defence, and this is a very interesting a phase between the nationalist women and the feminist women. It shows that they are strong enough in their ideology and their beliefs that they can have a public debate. And people talk about this as a split between the uh, feminists and the nationalists, but actually it's not. They continue to work together, but they have a serious conversation between each other about the nature of coming among and about the nature of female activism in 1914. And that conversation continues on. And it does transform, um, along with other uh, incidences, what coming among becomes as it goes along uh, through the revolutionary period. But the women themselves continued on their course. They adopted a green uniform with a slouch hat and a badge, uh, and a, uh, this badge, as you can see, the rifle with the initials of the organizations intertwined. So you can see their militarism is evident from this uniform, from their statements and their training. Soon after um, they, their formation, they began to get involved in very uh, open and public demonstrations of their nationalism. In July 1914, during the Hoth gun running, they were there, um, uh, they were in charge of the Defence of Ireland Fund to pay for the guns, and were in charge of hiding and distributing the guns. They were crucial to the gun running, uh, both in their funding and in hiding the guns. Ina Connolly Hearn, one of James Connolly's daughters, who was a member of Common Amman, camped with her sister Nora and the Countess Markovich and some Nafina Aaron boys uh, on the hill of Hoth before the guns were landed. Um, Ina Connolly Hearn wrote that the dear Countess said, you were the first woman to run guns up to the north. Show Eddie, Edward Carson, uh, what you can do. Deliver them safely is all I ask and I have every confidence of, uh, in you. So you can see here <coughs> that the women are from the very beginning participating in advanced nationalism. From the outbreak of war, we have another serious uh, discussion and, and perhaps the first big split uh, in coming among. Um, in August 1914, John Redmond, of course, offers the services of the volunteers to the British government, leading to an inevitable split in that organisation. But what people don't talk about is it also leads to a split in Common Amman, where they split on this issue. 
many women who had been supporters of the Irish Parliamentary Party and were now supporters of the National Volunteers and their participation in the, in the war effort leave Cumann Amman. And in October 1914, the executive of Cumann Amman issued a manifesto repudiating Redmond and his National Volunteers saying, we feel bound to make the pronouncement that to urge or encourage Irish volunteers to enlist in the British Army cannot, under any circumstances, be regarded as consistent with the work we have set ourselves to do. As I said, they split on this issue and many now left. However, people like, and this included, of course, Agnes O'Farrelly, who was a Redmondite. So, the woman who presided over the first meeting leaves on this issue, as do many of the other women. But as Jenny Wise Power said, and this is where the radicals start coming to the fore, they felt that the split cleared the road for the work of coming Amman. And you see from now on that women who really are going to participate in advanced nationalism remain in coming Amman. They fully participate in the 1916 Rising, well as fully as any of the organisations because of the confusion over orders and counter orders, etc. Almost all the women who came out in 1916 uh, in Dublin were members of Cumann Amman, the others obviously were members of the Irish Citizen Army. As confusion reigned about in those first, that first day, the first 24 hours, it was the women of Cumann Amman who took um, orders from Pierce and from Connolly around the country. Um, they, they went on trains, they, they drove, they cycled, uh, and they took different orders down to Wexford, to Galway, to Tralee, to Cork, uh, and around the country. Many of them made their way into the city centre, uh, some of them from in, in their branches, uh, because there were four or five branches in Dublin, and some of them individually. And they ended up in almost all the outposts except Bowen's Mill. Um, the con uh, as the week ended, however, and defeat became inevitable, Pierce selected one woman, sorry, one woman who I want to concentrate on here, Elizabeth O'Farrell. This is Elizabeth O'Farrell, a working class Dubliner, born and raised in the tenements on City Quay, who had been a long time member of Common Amman. Like so many of the women, she had been an activist prior to joining Common Amman. She had been in the Gaelic League, and interestingly enough, the Gaelic League seems to have been a breeding ground for many women who, who get involved in, in nationalism. They come from cultural nationalism into nationalism, as well as coming through feminist activism. She'd been in the Gaelic League in Indian Heron had been a member of Hannah Shee Skeffington's suffrage organisation, the Irish Women's Franchise League. She was also a member of the Irish Women Workers' Union and had worked in Liberty Hall during the 1913 lockout. During Easter week, she and other common Amman women perform as couriers, carrying messages and arms from the GPO to other outposts. They served as nurses and provided first aid for the wounded, including James Connolly, whom O'Farrell nursed in the GPO as it came under heavy artillery fire and began to burn. At the GPO, before Common Amman women left, as they were asked to by Pierce, he called them together and praised them for their bravery and heroism and devotion in the face of danger. A few did remain behind, uh, Car Winifred Carney, Elizabeth O'Farrell and Julia Grennan. Uh, at Maribyrlane, another outpost, 22 women of Common Amman under the command of Rose McNamara refused to leave um, and they remained until the very end. So, while some common Amman women do leave as de defeat becomes inevitable, quite a number stay in their outposts, and actually it ends up with 77 women uh, being imprisoned in the direct aftermath of the uh, rising. At the GPO, with a wounded Connolly in tow, O'Farrell and the other women retreated with the remaining rebels down Moore Street, and it's here that Pierce chooses O'Farrell to leave Moore Street, 16 Moore Street, under a white flag and make contact with the British military authorities to discuss the terms of surrender. She had to walk out under heavy fire and I think we forget that a lot of these women when they're, when they're doing this work, their work as couriers and message carriers, they're doing it under bombardment from the gunboats on the Liffey, from uh, fire, sniper fire from the outposts, from uh, crossing barricades where the heavily armed British soldiers are firing on the outposts. So they're doing it in a city under fire, and I think it's probably just luck that more of them weren't actually killed as they went around uh, about their duties. And O'Farrell comes out um, with the white flag and does make contact. Uh, later that afternoon, she accompanies Pierce towards General Lowe and his aide de camp, and can be seen beside him here. It's the famous photo with her feet. I don't know if all of you can see her feet. Uh, and that's the famous photo where she is airbrushed out occasionally. Um, when you see it uh, from history, she's removed 
And actually, Pierce is only wearing a short coat. The length, the coat, the, the, the long part of the coat is actually Elizabeth O'Farrell's coat covering her white um, apron, her white Red Cross apron. Um, so this is, that, that's her there. And she says she saw the photographer taking the photo and she stepped back so, um, uh, so she wouldn't be in view of the photograph. Uh, Rose McNamara, the officer in command of the Marlborough Lane dis Distillery, and this is Rose McNamara in her coming among outfit, uh, presented the surrender of herself and 21 other women. Uh, and an account of that surrender in the Bureau of Military Archives states, the women of the garrison could have evaded arrest, but they marched down four deep in uniform along with the men. An attempt was made to get them to sign a statement recanting their stand, but this failed. Miss McNamara, who led the contingent, went to the British OC and explained they were part of the rebel contention, contingent and were surrendering with the rest. So they see themselves as fighters along with the rest. And they were surrendering as fighters along with the rest and expected the same treatment. After the rising, Common Amman then is in the position, uh, as many of the women hadn't been arrested and weren't um, uh, interned, as many of the men were. So they are actually the ones who are keeping the Republican cause alive, particularly after the executions of the leaders. Uh, and as we go on into 1917, it's uh, the Common Amman women in the first anniversary of the rising who are very active in making sure that the proclamation is reissued, that the memory of the, those who had died is kept up, and, and that the men who are in jail, that their dependents are looked after, so they in, engage in huge fundraising drives. Uh, they did not wish the Republican ideal to die. They kept it alive through their propaganda <coughs> work, and, and they're very good at this propaganda work, distributing le leaflets and articles uh, in papers that would print them. Um, they are campaigning outside the jails, the early propaganda, Movement by Common Amman in, involved the production of Easter Week memorabilia, uh, flags, posters, uh, postcards of the Rising. So they're keeping that memory alive. At their convention in 1917, they elect Countess Markovic, who'd actually been quite critical of them in the beginning, in 1914, um, as their president. So you see, things have moved on very significantly. It's only three years since women like Markovic were seeing the women of Common Amman as taking a retrograde step in being auxiliaries, and Markovich certainly wouldn't ever have seen herself in a, as an auxiliary to anybody. They also, for the first time, include a clause which states, which is related directly <coughs> to women as members, and pledge to follow the policy of the Republican proclamation, that is the 1916 proclamation, by seeing that women take up their proper position in the life of the nation. So you can see they now see themselves as equal citizens. They want in the new republic that's going to be created. They will be full and equal citizens. So they are going to give their all to the creation of that uh, republic. Uh, and they, they, all funds collected would be for the arming equip and equipping of men and women uh, of Ireland. No longer would come in among women be the auxiliaries or the handmaidens of the Irish volunteers. When in February 1918, women over 30 were finally granted the vote, <coughs> a common Amman statement said that generations of Irish women have longed to possess the weapon which has been now put in their hands. Ireland demands this service of you. To ignore the demand would be treason. And they get women out to vote uh, and use that vote, that weapon as they call it. And they do it very effectively uh, in that its president, Countess Markovic, um, is elected and she is one of the first women that is elected um, to the Westminster, Parli Westminster Parliament. Obviously, she doesn't, uh, oh, sorry, they, they put out this, has it stopped? Yes, sorry, their manifesto in 1918, which was that um, the present duty of Irish women, specifically to new women voters, your country calls you to restore its rightful place among the nations no sacrifice is at, no greater sacrifice is asked of you. You are to secure the votes to which you're entitled and use them on behalf of Sinn Féin. Perhaps one of the things I would suggest that's interesting here, Sinn Féin sweeps the board at the general election. Um, obviously, coming among throws its weight behind Sinn Féin um, candidates. But also, the Irish Parliamentary Party had not included uh, women's suffrage in, its, in the Third Home Rule Bill and had denied uh, deliberately the campaign of uh, Hannah Skeffington and the Irish Women's Franchise League, that women's suffrage be included. And I don't think those feminists who are now uh, involved in the cause of nationalism, like Jenny Wise Power, forgot 
And indeed, Jenny Wise Power does mention the fact that the Irish IPP had, had uh, repudiated the right of women to be full and equal citizens in 1912, and they're certainly not going to throw their support behind them in 1918. So what part did the coming on play in the, uh, uh, in the overwhelming defeat of the Irish Parliamentary Party candidates in 1918, as well, obviously, as the fact that the atmosphere and the, the whole uh, nation had changed by 1918. During the War of Independence, then, um, Common Man plays a vital and front-line front line role against the forces of the British state. Throughout these years, they shared the risk with the men of violence and death and arrest and imprisonment. They participated in gun running, message carrying, safe, uh, ran his safe houses, and they were the ones who faced the constant raids by the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries on their home, where they were violently mistreated often. <coughs> They more than answered the call to arms and returned, demanded a full role in the anticipated Irish Republic. Now the first event of the War of Independence, of course, is the shooting of two RIC men in Sulla Head Bay. Uh, and in January, uh, in January uh, 21st, 1919, by April 1919, Cumann was calling for a boycott of British police and officials. As the war intensified, Black and Tans raided suspected Republican women's homes and where they found <coughs> arms or incriminating documents, as they often did, they immediately arrested the homeowners. Um, they, they arrested women for collecting funds without a, pit, uh, a permit and for all sorts of other reasons. The women were the backbone of the struggle. Without them, the war could not have been conducted for as long as it went on, said one report of uh, the British Army. They smuggled guns, carried dispatches, organized public meetings, arranged concerts and fundraisers. Frustrated by their inability to stop the guerrilla war or capture the male fighters, the Black and Tans often turned their frustration on the women. The American Commission on Conditions in Ireland um, gave evidence on, of the frequency with which the sanctity of the family home was violated and they had recorded almost 50,000 British Army raids on private homes by 1920. Lil Conlon, a member of Common Amman, in her statement, stated that in se April to September 1921, attention was focused on the women very much at this time by the auxiliaries. They were in receipt of information from their intelligence division owing to raids and captures of documents, and they fully realized that women were playing a major part in the campaign. The going was tough on the female sex. They were unable to go out on the run, and, and this is the problem. The women of Common Amman, while participating fully in the War of Independence, unlike the men, couldn't actually go on the run and escape the direct attentions of the Black and Tans. And this reign of terror was intensified uh, from 1921. Particularly night entries were forced into homes and the women's hair was cut off, often in brutal fashion, as well as suffering other indignities and insults. By 1921, several commandants of the IRA had sent letters to common Amman women recognizing that there was no question of the girls only helping in dispatch carrying, scouting and intelligence work, all of which were highly dangerous. They did far more than the soldiers. In addition to this, the flying columns would have collapsed early this year were it not for the assistance of the women, organized and unorganized. On the matter then, uh, as the Anglo-Irish Treaty came to an end, um, and the women, obviously, at this stage had suffered an awful lot of violence on them. And again, this is another area that needs to be researched, and perhaps we will get more information on that uh, in the pension files as more and more files are released. Is the, the amount of violence suffered by women <laughs> because of of Common Amman's participation in the War of Independence. And again, they were in that direct front line. They were there in the communities when homes were burned, um, when night raids were launched, and oftentimes that, that uh, violence visited at them um, was sexual violence. You know, pulled out of their beds late at night, oftentimes stripped, searched, uh, their hair shaved, that's very much a, a part of sexual violence, and I think that's more, we need to go more into that uh, and see what type of violence was visited on these women. Uh, and they didn't get any recognition of that, um, because of course, the type of violence visited on the men, the, the violence you get in military activity, being shot and things like that, that's seen as pa patriot blood, whereas the blood the women spilled was something that they didn't talk about <coughs> later on, and something perhaps we still are, are a bit loath to talk about. After the War of Independence and the Anglo-Irish Treaty was negotiated, uh, Cumann Amman split again. Um, 
On the 5th of February 1922, a convention of the organisation was held. Uh, and at that convention, 415 members voted against the treaty, as opposed to 63 in favour. At the, this convention to discuss the treaty, a resolution had been put forward by Mary McSweeney, sister of Terence McSweeney, the Lord Mayor of Cork, who had died on hunger strike, which explicitly stated that it called on the women of Ireland in support of the forthcoming election, only those candidates who stood through, who stood through to the existing republic proclaimed in 1916. So she calls on all women to support only those who were anti-treaty. In the ensuing civil war, as the moderates drifted away from coming among, the most radical members remain active in support of the uh, anti-treaty side. It was banned by the Irish Free State, coming among was banned by the Irish Free State in 1923, and over 500 of its members were imprisoned during the civil war. That's a, an ironic thing. Uh, actually, an awful lot of common among members weren't in prison during the War of Independence by the British authorities, in large part because they were afraid of creating martyrs, particularly female martyrs, and creating a, a bad propaganda campaign. You have to remember that the First World War had started in large part, the propaganda around it was free, you know, protecting the, well, the women of Belgium and protecting the women of France. Well, now the British couldn't be seen to be uh, imposing their will on the women of Ireland. Uh, and of course they, they didn't want to upset the light, large Irish American um, uh, population either in doing things like that. It is during the war of, or the Civil War that you get most common among members imprisoned by the state, by the Irish Free State. 500 of them held in Kilmainham Jail and the North Dublin Union. During the Civil War the imprisoned common among women used the weapon of the hunger strike quite effectively. Mary McSweeney, uh, again the, the sister of Terence McSweeney's first hunger strike and the propaganda related to it, was the device which attracted the greatest amount of attention to the anti-treaty cause and to the anti-treaty coming among women. She claimed that she was striking against foreign domination in Ireland. Um, and so they staged monster rallies and marches and protests, things which they were well used to doing. They even got the press involved. People all over Ireland bombarded the government with letters. Uh, they, W.T. Cosgrave, the president of the executive, was advised to release her because allowing her to die would create an instant martyr, like her brother Terence, who had died in a hunger strike during the War of Independence. Um, she was on strike for 24 days, and finally uh, she was released because they thought she was about to die. Other hunger strikes were not so successful, and of course you have a public weary of war, less interested in continuing the civil war. As Sheila Humphrey said about the despair felt by the female prisoners after the ceasefire, we were flattered. We felt the Irish public we were flattened, sorry, we felt the Irish public had forgotten us. The tented trappings of our fight were hanging like rags about us. <coughs> and as Lil Collin says about the ceasefire, at a special meeting of the executive of Cumin Amman, it was unanimously agreed to discontinue the organization as it was, as it was considered as it was the considered option that we had conscientiously performed our duty to the government and to the nation. So that was the end of uh, the of the involvement of Irish women in the War of Independence and the Civil War. It leaves a bitter taste in there, in the mouths of many of the women, um, and many of them remain silent of their activities after. Um, the Civil War had ended, and indeed, some commentators, particularly male commentators, blamed common among women for the Civil War, called them unmanageable revolutionaries, furies, <coughs> ungovernable women, women with blood on their hands, uh, who wanted to continue fighting. But we cannot deny that between 1914 and 1923, thousands of common among women participated in the nationalist struggle, often, often engaged on several fronts all at once. Uh, these women played a vital role in bringing together the different strands of revolutionary movement. The military, the political, the feminist and the socialist causes were just integrated in the body of Common Amman finally as they came towards the end of the War of Independence. In looking at Common Amman, the release of the military history files is going to be a boon to historians and researchers and local historians to elicit the true picture of who was in Common Amman. Uh, outside of the leadership, we know quite a lot about the leadership and, and a lot has been written about those over the, the last two decades. But what about the ordinary members? Uh, what, who were they? Um, what was their background? Were they, what, classes, what class were they from? Were they working class? Were they middle class? Were they urban? Were they rural? Etc, etc. 
In looking at the files, because of speaking here today, I had a particular look at Dublin 7. And many of the women from the Dublin 7 area were member of the Columkill branch of Common Man. I hope this works. Can you, can you read that? It doesn't take a picture very well, but if you go into the military archives. As you can see, where's the Columkill branch? Here. Oh, here. In 19... There's 44 members in 1922. 21 and 28 in 1922, so that's later on. So this Cullen Hill branch, which was set up just before 1916, um, and some also from this area were members of the central branch, met in Blackhall Place in the Cullen Hill Hall. Many of these women, most of them young, and that's the thing that's coming out, that many of the women outside of the leadership who joined Cullen Amman were young women, uh, including my own grandmother, actually, uh, who joined in Kerry. She was 17 when she joined in 1918. Uh, so they're late teens, early 20s, they're unmarried, uh, they're often related to young men who are in the Irish Volunteers, uh, they're often from families who've already been involved in either the Gaelic League um, or in uh, other types of activism in Dublin for example who may have been involved in trade union activism um, and things like that. So they're already coming from families who are politically aware. Uh, not all of them but quite a number. Um, and I'll put up uh, uh, some names in a minute and you might recognise some of you who are from the area. The Column Hill branch, uh, 30 members of this branch gathered at the Fianna Hall and Merchants Club <coughs> each Easter Monday in 1916. So it had, uh, you know, it was only formed a short while, it already had 30 members who were out in 1916. But because of confusion they went home and came gathered again on Tuesday. They weren't, they were such a new branch, they weren't actually affiliated with any uh, volunteer company. So they didn't quite know where to go. And they came back on Tuesday uh, and decided to make their own way into the action. So many of them end up in different places, as you will see when I put up um, the, the um, or when I talk about them. They end up in the Mendicity, or Medicine, Medicity <coughs> Institute, um, in the GPO, in Blackhall Place, in Father Matthew Hall. They end up, uh, you know, setting up first aid stations. They end up nursing in various outposts, in message carrying, and doing all sorts of things. And most of these are young women, young unmarried women. And I just want to name, and again I think it's very important to name a few of them uh, who I found in looking through the files of, of the, um, and that's the, the ones who were there in 1916, you possibly can't read them, but go online and you will see them. There was a Katie Byrne who was from 17 North Richmond Street uh, her Easter Rising uh, service was in the area of the Four Courts, in King Street, Dublin, Monk's Bakery, uh, and she was uh, associated with the Central Branch of Common Amon. Her married name was Rooney, but as Katie Byrne, she was a member of Common Amon out in 1916. She um, evaded capture or arrest following her participation in 1916. During the Rising, she carried out first aid duties and carried dispatches. And again, remember how dangerous that would have been. During 19, she assisted in the collection and transportation of arms from Glasgow and Belfast to Dublin. From 1919 to 1921, during the War of Independence, she worked in assisting the General Headquarters Active Service Unit, the, D the Dublin Brigade Active Service Unit, and 2nd B B Battalion Dublin Brigade IRA. To this end, as well as providing her home as a meeting place and safe house, and receiving and treating wounded Irish volunteers and Irish IRA members, she assisted in intelligence work, storage and transportation of arms, and carried dispatches, um, and so on. She was in, uh, associated with uh, uh, Sean McKeown. She got a grade E pension. Uh, there were several grades of uh, pensions, obviously A, B, C, D, E. The E was the lowest grade. You will find mostly women got grade E, and that's something I think we need to revisit as well. Mary Byrne from 28 Malachy Road, Manor Place. <coughs> Uh, had been involved in 1916. She joined the organization in 1915. Uh, she was a member of the Column Hill <coughs> branch. She was involved during the Easter Rising, carrying ammunition daily from her own house and from Michael Staines's home in Myrtle Road to the barricades and also involved in cooking for the volunteers, principally at Glen Builder's Yard. She stayed she remained an active member until 1918. Uh, her husband was a member of the IRA and it seems she was assisting him. It was also a Mayor, Mary Lawler from 29 Ardry Road, Arbor Hill, who was a member of the Colin Kill branch. She was out in 1916. She carried arms, first aid supplies, dispatches, as well as supplying information regarding the movement of British soldiers. And 
this is a very important activity um, that the Cumann Amman women did. They carried out intelligence work. She was not arrested or interned during the War of Independence. She assisted in dispatch work and the storage and distribution of arms. A dump was maintained at her family home. Most of her work was carried out for her brother Liam O'Carroll uh, and for Pather Breslin. Her father Peter O'Carroll was killed by the British force, forces in October 1920. You have an Ellen Parker from uh, 81 Brian Road Fairview who was also part of the Columkill branch, uh, or sorry she was in the uh, central branch. She uh, was involved in 1916 but obviously at this, uh, by, the end, by the War of Independence she was living in the North Circular Road and her house there was used as a dump and arms storage for um, the Irish Volunteers. This is just a taster of the riches that are to be found in these um, files of the um, military service files and you can find the names of um, the various members of the Column Kill branch of, uh, who, who would be particular to this area. Uh, and in looking at those names you can then look at the 1901-1911 census uh, and try and build up a, gene a genealogy profile of those women. Who were they? What background are they coming from? Uh, it seems to me that most of these women were working class women. They were young women. Most of them are unmarried. They get married later on and, and mostly they marry other Irish volunteers. I think Liz Gillis who spoke last spoke about that when she was talking about uh, the uh, families she spoke about who had been involved or spoke to who had been involved in this period, that they're intermarrying, those networks are continuing uh, after uh, the setting up of the Irish Free State. One thing I will mention, these women <coughs> apply for military service pensions and they do get them, but they all get the grade E, they all get the lowest pension you can get because it was seen that the work they did was not as important as shooting. Uh, it was not as important as the work the men did. And you can see here a very gendered uh, take on the type of work women did. But I would ask you, how can you carry out a war without dispatch carrying, without intelligence work, without safe houses, without the food, without nursing care? All of that sort of backup work that the women did. And they were also on the front lines. And again, remember that. They were the ones whose houses were being raided, who were being dragged out of bed in the middle of the night by the auxiliaries or the black and tans. Um, they couldn't go on the run. You know, they, violence was a, a, an everyday or, or, or a you know, frequent visitor to their lives and their homes. So again, we have to understand that the women's participation, even by those who were, you know, judging them for their pension file, for their pensions, was being seen in, as lesser than that of the men. Uh, and I think, you know, that was not right, basically. I think we could all say that was not right. Um, so these are just a taster of the riches that await the researcher in the pension files. And a second tranche of those files, very excitingly, are coming out in 1915. And the rest then, they should all be out by 1916 because the, the files we have now are just those women who participated in, men and women, who participated in the rising. The files we'll get later on will be all those who participated in the War of Independence and Civil War. So there's so much more to come. It's going to be years and years and years of burrowing and digging through these files. Um, and this combining of these files and resources we have now will give us a much more complicated and nuanced understanding of the, the history of Cumann Amman and the women who were in it and what they did. And combining what we know from the Bureau of Military Archives, from the pension files, with things like the 1901 and 1911 census, as well as archival material in other archives, and memoirs, diaries, oral histories, all the riches of, of archival resources that we have now, we'll be able to build up a much better profile of the women, their socioeconomic background, their families, their networks, their activities, their alliances with various other organizations, socialists, feminists, um, you know, how, and it seems, and, and this is just a very general um, idea that I'm beginning to get from a very surface look as yet, is that they were all involved in so many different things, or certainly a lot of them were involved in so many different things. Uh, and also their debates and their splits, I mean these women didn't just follow on, they had their own ideological uh, ideas, they thought about what they were doing, they had debates between each other and with the men, so they're fully engaged with, on an intellectual level as well as a practical level and a physical level, with their ideas around nationalism and feminism, etc. So I would call out to everybody, historians, researchers, local histories, organizations like this, 
to look at 2014 as an opportunity to look at these women again and what they did um, and the fight they fought uh, and why in lots of ways um, they go silent after the Civil War because that's, that's another interesting point. A lot of common among women don't ever talk about their, uh, what they did. My own grandmother never really spoke about her common among experiences and I, I'm beginning, I have some ideas because I've heard it from other people of what she did and was pretty bloody and violent. And that could, you know, obviously it could be post-traumatic stress uh, that people didn't want to talk. But I think particularly for the women, because they were doing something that women weren't supposed to do, we have to see it from a gender perspective as well. They were involved in violence. They were involved in public activism. These are things women weren't supposed to do. And then the Irish Free State constructs women back into the domestic realm. So therefore, vocal women, public women, were not really respectable women in the Irish Free State. So does, does the society we get after 1923 have enforce a certain silence and shaming of these women and what they did during the, the War of Independence uh, and the Easter Rising. And I think today uh, and this month and the rest of this year and from now on we should pay homage to the work of these women and uh, also make sure we do the best type of research and look at what they did and elucidate their contribution to the revolutionary struggle. Thanks.